Assalamu alaikum everybody, today we'll be talking about Carnibacterium diphtheriae. In some places it is also pronounced as Carnibacterium diphtheriae, you should go with the one you like. I'll go with the Carnibacterium because I think it's easy to pronounce. But before getting into the video, I'd like to tell you guys that these videos are meant for educational purposes. Things and treatments may change with time. If I get wrong or miss anything, your input is always welcomed in the comments section. Have a cup of tea and let's get started. But before talking about corny bacterium diphtheria in detail, we should know how the bacteria is classified and under which category the corny bacterium diphtheria come. Bacteria are further classified into spirochetes and acid fast, also mycoplasma bacterium, that's an exception. On the basis of gram staining, bacteria are further classified into gram negative, we'll be looking at them in the future videos, and also into gram positive. Gram positive are further classified into cocci and rods. Rods are further subdivided into non spore forming and spore forming. We are done with the spore forming rods in our recent videos. If you guys have missed those videos, be sure to check them out. And today we'll be talking about non spore forming rods, which are further subdivided into filamentous which has Gardnerella vaginalis, Nocardia and Actinomyces and non-filamentous which has the Cornibacterium diphtheriae, the topic of today's video and Listeria monocytogenes. Non-spore forming bacterium are also classified differently like um, if they are not filamentous they will be aerobic or anaerobic. Aerobic are further classified into motile and non-motile or immotile. The motile is further subdivided into Listeria monocytogenes and the non-motile is further subdivided into Nocardia asteroides and Cornibacterium diphtheriae. Cornibacterium diphtheriae. The word Cornibacterium has got two specific words in it. The first one is corny or corini. That means club shaped. Club shaped is just like that. Long at one end and wider at the other end. And the second one is bacterium. It means that this is a bacterium, right? The Cornibacterium is gram positive rod. It is a facultative probe and it is also called as Klebs Loeffler Bacillus. You might be thinking why? Because it is cultured in such a culture media. It is pleomorphic. Pleo means many and morph is for shapes. It means that this bacterium exists in different shapes. Like it has got V shape, L shape, club shape. It is also the rod shaped bacterium. As you can see in this picture, this is its V shape, this is its L shape, this is its club shape, and this is its rod shape. It is catalase positive. If you don't know what is catalase, it is an enzyme that is released by certain bacteria and that converts hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. And oxygen is responsible for forming bubbles. So in the test tube or on a slide, the microscopic slide, there might be bubbles present. If you don't know much about catalase test, I do have a video that is linked in the description or in the top right corner. The Cornibacterium diphtheria is the carbohydrate fermenter. When it ferments the carbohydrate, lactic acid is produced. This bacterium has a short chain mycolic acid. That's why it is not the acid fast bacterium. It is non-filamentous, not responsible for producing spores, but it does produce a toxin. That is the diphtheria toxin and that is responsible for causing the famous disease diphtheria. Lecture outline. We are done with the introduction and classification. Now we'll be looking at morphology habitat in transmission, pathogenesis, clinical findings, lab diagnosis, treatment, prevention, and at the end, as usual, we'll review the lecture. Morphology, shape. As we know, corny bacterium are gram-positive rods. They appear club-shaped, which means wider at one end, just like that. Arrangement. They're arranged in palisades or V or L-shaped formations, just like that. Appearance. The rods have a beaded appearance. Beads consist of granules of highly polymerized phosphate, a storage mechanism for high energy phosphate bonds. The granules stain metachromatically, that is a dye that stains the rest of the cells blue will stain the granules red. As you can see there, this is a club shaped bacterium, rest of the cells are blue, but the granules are red colored, right? They are stained metachromatically. Cornibacterium diphtheria is 2 micrometers in length but it can vary. It's purple or blue in color because it is gram positive and it will retain the dye and the reason behind retaining is its thick 
peptidoglycan layer in its cell wall. Right now, we are talking about the structure of corny bacterium diphtheriae. It is not capsulated, it is non-motile, it is not responsible for producing spores, and it releases a toxin that is diphtheria toxin, and that plays a major role in the pathogenesis of diphtheria, the infection. In this picture, you can see this is the V-shaped corny bacterium diphtheriae. This is the L-shaped, and this is the club-shaped bacterium, and this one is the rod. That's why it is called the pleomorphic, which means having many shapes. Habitate. Humans are the only host. Both the toxigenic and non-toxigenic organisms reside in upper respiratory tract, commonly in upper respiratory tract, but it can also be found in gastrointestinal and genitourinary tract. The only difference between the toxigenic and non-toxigenic corny bacterium diphtheria is the production of toxin and the ability to cause a disease due to the toxin production. Transmission. Diphtheria is transmitted via respiratory droplets or airborne droplets. The organism can also infect the skin at the site of a pre-existing skin lesion. There are certain risk factors like this disease occurs primarily in tropics, but it can occur worldwide in indigenous persons with poor skin hygiene and it is also common in children. Pathogenesis. The corny bacterium diphtheria is usually harmless unless it is infected by a bacteriophage. The pathogenesis involved in the diphtheria is toxigenic type, which means that the toxin is released. Bacteria, when in the human body, it will adhere and it will infiltrate. So there will be adhesion and infiltration of the bacteria. Although exotoxin production is essential for pathogenesis, invasion is also necessary because the organism must first establish and maintain itself in the throat because the primary location of diphtheria is the throat. And you know what? The bacteriophage carries a gene that gives rise to the toxin. So when the corny bacterium diphtheria is infected by a bacteriophage, it will get pathogenic and it will cause infection. And where will this bacterium adhere? It will adhere into the mucosal layers of the body. Virulence factors. This is the toxin, the diphtheria toxin or the beta prophage AB toxin. It does what? It inhibits the protein synthesis via ADP ribosylation of elongation factor 2 or EF2 that results in cell death or necrosis. Let's talk about the toxin, the diphtheria toxin. It is a single polypeptide with two functional domains. These are the two domains, right? The first one is the binding domain, this red one, and the second one is the active domain, this blue one. The binding domain mediates binding of the toxin to glycoprotein receptors on the cell membrane, while the active domain does what? It possesses enzymatic activity that cleaves cotinamide from nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, NAD, and transfers the remaining ADP ribose to elongation factor 2, thereby inactivating it. The DNA that codes for diphtheria toxin is the part of DNA of temporary bacteriophage that is called the beta phage that infects the corny bacterium diphtheria and then the toxin is produced and then this toxin causes the diphtheria infection. Let me tell you something really cool. During the lysogenic phase of viral growth, the DNA of this virus integrates into the bacterial chromosome and the toxin is synthesized. Corny bacterium diphtheria cells that are not lysogenized by this phage do not produce exotoxin and are non-pathogenic. Uh, by now we know that corny bacterium diphtheria is responsible for causing what? The famous disease diphtheria. It has got following two types or kinds, whatever you call it. The first one is respiratory and the second one is cutaneous. Definitely respiratory will be occurring in the upper respiratory tract just like the one you can see in this picture. This is the pseudomembrane, the significant characteristic of the diphtheria. And the second one is the cutaneous that is occurring in the skin. There will be two major host responses to corny bacterium diphtheria. The first one, a local inflammation in throat will occur. This will be with a fibrous exudate and that will form the tough adherent gray pseudomembrane and that is the characteristic of diphtheria. And the second response is the antibody. The antibody that can neutralize the exotoxin activity by blocking the interaction of binding domain with the receptors thereby preventing entry into the cell.
Clinical findings. The first one is pseudomembranous pharyngitis. Pseudomembranous pharyngitis, it will have some non-specific upper respiratory tract symptoms like fever, sore throat, cervical ad adenopathy. There, first, there will be erythematous pharyngitis, then that will progress to pseudomembranous pharyngitis. On scratching that membrane, there will be bleeding. Systemic symptoms include cervical lymphadenopathy, myocarditis, acute tubular necrosis, adrenal insufficiency. These are kind of the complications of diphtheria. Now, what is a pseudomembrane? When I was talking about the first host response, the local inflammation, I told you that there is a fibrinous exudate that forms the tough, adherent, gray pseudomembrane there. And that pseudomembrane is firmly adherent to what? To tonsils, palate, uvula, and nasopharynx. This is how the pseudomembrane looks like. And it is composed of necrotic tissue, the dead tissue, bacterial cells, lymphocytes, plasma cells, and fibrin. Fibrin plays a major role in its adherence to the uh, mucosal layer in our mouth. The second one, the cutaneous diphtheria. It causes ulcerating skin lesions that is covered by a gray membrane, as you can see this one. These lesions are often indolent and often do not invade surrounding tissue. Systemic symptoms rarely occur and this will be a non-healing ulcer. Now let's sum up all the symptoms. There will be thick gray membrane called pseudomembrane. There will be fever, sore throat and ulcerating skin lesion. Now let's talk about the complications. The extension of membrane into the larynx and trachea can cause airway obstruction. Myocarditis accompanied by arrhythmias and circulatory collapse. Nerve weakness or paralysis, especially of cranial nerves. Paralysis of muscles of soft palate and pharynx can lead to regurgitation of fluids through the nose. Peripheral neuritis affecting the muscles of extremities also occurs. Lab diagnosis will go for the throat swab because the site of the infection is the throat and will go for gram staining and on gram staining this bacterium is gram positive because it's purple or blue color and in methylene blue what happens there will be metachromatic granules granules will be stained red while the rest of the cells will be stained blue under microscopy this bacterium was found to be pleomorphic because of its club shape rod shape we or l shape all of them are called diphtheroids right this bacterium is two micrometers in length but this is not the hard and fast rule that this is two micrometers so it will be two micrometers it can vary color because of gram staining and it's gram positive this bacterium will be purple or blue as you can see in this picture this is the club shaped bacterium this is the l shape this is the v shape and this is the rod shaped bacterium normally what happens that diphtheria is diagnosed with clinical symptoms we don't need to go for all the labs but whenever necessary we can go for a throat swab and that should be cultured on Leuffler's medium, a telluride plate, and also on a blood agar. The telluride plate, or the Leuffler's medium, is the selective media, while the blood agar is the non-selective media. The colonies formed will be black in color, and there will be a small zone of hemolysis. The telluride plate contains a tellurium salt that is reduced to elemental tellurium within the organism, the Cornibacterium diphtheriae. The typical grey-black colour of tellurium in the colony is a telltale diagnostic criterion, as you can see in this one on the left side. If the cornibacterium diphtheria is recovered from the cultures, that's great. If it's not, then we'll go for what? The antibody-based gel diffusion precipitin test that is performed to document toxin production. Other tests are a PCR assay for the presence of toxin gene in the organism that is being isolated from the patient. There's another test that is ELEC test that is used to detect the toxin protein. This test, the Schick test, that is used to detect the immunity of a patient who is suffering from diphtheria. We can say that if we are going to assess the immune status of a person, that can be assessed by Schick test. The test is performed by intradermal injection of 0.1 ml of purified standardized toxin. If the patient has no antitoxin, the toxin will cause inflammation at the site four to seven days later. 
if no inflammation occurs, antitoxin is present and the patient is immune. Okay, the last one. These are the biochemical tests. Cystinase is going to be positive for cornibacterium diphtheria and pyrazinamidase will be negative. The treatment of choice is the antitoxin that is made in horses that can be given immediately on the basis of clinical impression as I mentioned in lab diagnosis that labs are necessary if the patient is not diagnosed after the clinical assessment. The toxin binds rapidly and irreversibly to cells and once bound that cannot be neutralized by antitoxin. The function of antitoxin is to neutralize the unbound toxin in the blood. So if it is bound, it will not be neutralized. We can also go for maintenance of airway because when the membrane, the pseudomembrane will go backwards in our larynx, it will cause airway obstruction. So that can cause respiratory distress that can lead to death. So for preventing that, we are going to do what? We'll maintain the airway. The drugs of choice are penicillin G and erythromycin. We'll also go for a vaccine that is DTAP vaccine. Its full form is diphtheria toxoid, tetanus toxoid, and acellular pertussis. Its old version was DTP and now it is upgraded and it is DTAP. So don't get confused between DTAP and DTP. Prevention. The toxoid vaccine, the DTAP, is going to do what? Is going to prevent the patient or is going to prevent people from getting diphtheria. All right, guys, let's show you everything in this short table. The organism we discussed today is Cornibacterium diphtheria. It is responsible for causing what? Diphtheria. It is transmitted via respiratory droplets and skin wounds in pre-existing skin lesions. Hosts are the human beings. It is diagnosed by gram staining, microscopy, culture, presbyterian test, PCR, and don't forget about the metachromatic stain. It is treated with diphtheria, antitoxin, penicillin G, erythromycin, and DTAP vaccine. And that's it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you've got any suggestions, feel free to leave them below in the comments. And if you want to connect with me on my socials, I've got my Instagram, Twitter, and I'll catch you in the next video. Till then, assalamu alaikum.